Hello, everyone. My name is Arya Javadan, and I'm the program coordinator for the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. Welcome to the latest presentation in the NCTRC webinar series. Today's session is on possible futures telehealth during and after the pandemic. Uh, today's webinar is being hosted by the Pacific Basin Telehealth Resource Center. These webinars are designed to provide timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth programs, and they are presented on the third Thursday of each month. Uh, just to provide some background on the consortium located throughout the country, there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers and two national, one focused on telehealth policy and the other on telehealth technology assessment. Each serve as focal points for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. Uh, a few tips before we get started. Your audio has been muted. Please use the Q&A function of the Zoom platform to ask questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, please note that closed captioning is available and is located at the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will be able to access today's and past webinars on the NCTRC YouTube channel. Uh, with that, I will pass it over to Christina Higa, Director of the Pacific Basin Telehealth Resource Center. Christina? Thank you, Aria, and aloha, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I am um, Christina Higa, the co-director of the Pacific Basin Telehealth Resource Center, and I'm communicating to you here from here in Hawaii, and it's 8 o'clock a.m. in the morning here. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Matthew Koenig. Dr. Matthew Koenig is a neural intensivist with our Queens Medical Center here in Hawaii, and he serves as the medical director there for telehealth. He is also an associate professor of medicine with the University of Hawaii John A. Burns School of Medicine. Dr. Koenig led the development of the Hawaii Telestroke Network beginning in 2011. And he has been a very strong advocate for telehealth, even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. He has been a leader in guiding our way in the use of technology and telehealth through this public health emergency. I also wanted to note that Dr. Koenig has recently been recognized as one of our top leaders in telehealth in our region. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Dr. Koenig. Great, thank you, Christina. I'm gonna share my screen here um, and start my slideshow. Okay, I think you should be seeing my slides now. Yes. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, I have a couple of disclosures. I don't have any financial disclosures. Um, I don't have any stock in any telehealth companies. I'm gonna show you a bunch of brand names here. I don't have any um, disclosures related to any of the products or vendors that I'm gonna show you today. I don't even let them buy me lunch. Um, the disclosures that I have is that I'm also funded by HRSA uh, through the Telehealth Network uh, Grant Program, TNGP. Um, and I'm not gonna say a word about that project, actually. I'm gonna focus almost entirely on ambulatory telehealth because that's, that's where the bulk of what we've done during the pandemic lies. Um, my other disclosure is that I'm on call currently. I'm in the middle of a long stretch on call I'm, on, I'm covering telestroke for 11 hospitals right now. There was a knock at my door and I handed my pager off to a colleague, <clears throat> but I may have interruptions, hopefully not. Um, and that also means that I'm like underslept and hypercaffeinated. So it's gonna be fast and furious today. <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, dive right into the talk. So just to define the word telehealth as we do here at Queens Health Systems uh, in Hawaii, we, we try to standardize our terminology. And so we have been doing a lot of hospital-based telehealth through our telestroke program. I'm not gonna talk much about that today. We also have a uh, program we call clinic-to-clinic -clinic telehealth, which is satellite brick and mortar clinics that have telehealth equipment. Uh, for example, in Hilo uh, on the big island, and that serves us well for patients who are located on the neighbor islands outside of Oahu. Um, but the majority of what I'm gonna talk about today is related to what we call virtual home visit, which is our direct to patient telehealth services. And then just to comment that we are in a growth phase related to virtual urgent care or, or patient initiated on-demand video visits. Uh, we just stood up that program uh, about two months ago and we are just dipping our toes into remote patient monitoring. So these are the, are the, are the pillars of telehealth in our organization moving forward. Uh, a little bit, oh, 
slow responsiveness here. Uh, uh, I wanted to show you our experience of the growth of the volume of telehealth uh, during the pandemic. And um, in the blue, you will, what, what you see here is video telehealth. That includes all of the telehealth that I mentioned uh, in the first slide. And then the orange band is telephone, by which we mean audio only visits. Um, and so as you can see, prior to the pandemic, uh, beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, we were doing some telehealth. We'd actually projected to do 2,500 telehealth visits that year as an organization. But like many other organizations, we saw a very rapid rise of telehealth related to the pandemic. I think unlike some organizations that saw rapid growth in the early days of the pandemic and then a slow fade back towards baseline, we really have had sustained adoption of telehealth across the organization. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how we accomplish that and, 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 and why I think this will be an important part of our organization going forward as we've made major investments in the integration of our telehealth program into our electronic medical record and patient portal. Um, that has been some of the keys to the success of the our program that I'm gonna highlight during my talk today. And you see there's some peaks and valleys uh, related to various waves of the pandemic uh, here in Hawaii. Uh, but the, the telehealth uh, volume remains quite strong. And last month in June, we did 16,000 telehealth visits as an organization. Um, the direct COVID related services that we provided is a small slice of the pie that's about 3% of telehealth. And our hospital-based and clinic to clinic programs are very low volume. They're important parts of our program, but they're low volume compared to the virtual home visit, which really has dwarfed other telehealth services. About 95% of the telehealth that we've done in the last year has been direct to patient. And in fiscal year 2022, which just ended in July for us, we did 193,000 telehealth visits, which is uh, an unbelievable number. I never would have predicted we would have done that much telehealth in the last year. Um, and these names don't necessarily mean much to you, but just to point out that the telehealth is not just in our hub hospital here, but really distributed throughout the organization. Um, this is a, a slide from our ambulatory visits overall uh, within Queens Health Systems across all of our um, 80 clinics in the organization. And the red band is video telehealth, blue is in-person and green is telephone. So you can see, and this is you know, very recent data, you can see we're still doing about 20% of our ambulatory visits as telehealth across the organization. It didn't start out that way, right? So taking the way back machine to the very beginning of the pandemic, which seems so long ago, uh, again, you can see that we were doing about 200 telehealth visits per month as an organization prior to the pandemic. Uh, what we were actually doing during this time was we were investing in, uh, in an EPIC integrated telehealth uh, third party system. We had, had purchased uh, licenses through a company called STA Extended Care back in July of 2019. Um, and we recognized at that time that direct to patient telehealth was going to be an important part of our services. Um, and already uh, prior to the pandemic was about 50% of the telehealth that we were doing as an organization. Um, and so we spent that time from July 2019 up until March of 2020, uh, building out a EPIC integrated uh, version of extended care. Um, and we had a planned go live for, those, for that new product in March of 2020. We planned to go live with three departments, cardiology, neurology, and pulmonology. And then the pandemic hit and we had to make a choice of either, instead of doing three departments, doing 200 departments across the organization, or just putting various clinics and providers on whatever was convenient. And I think we made the right choice by choosing the latter. We, we uh, purchased many, many licenses for, for Cisco WebEx in our organization, and we supported that for about 50% of our providers and clinics. Other clinics were allowed to migrate to whatever product they were most comfortable with. And, Clinics and uh, providers chose Zoom or Doxy.me or other products. And that created a fair amount of chaos in the organization, um, meaning that patients who you know, got all their care at Queens, they might use Zoom for one provider and Doxy for another provider and extended care for another provider. And so that's on the negative side. On the positive side, it actually gave our organization a lot of experience with 
easy to use off the shelf web RTC or app based products. And it allowed us to watch kind of, you know, if you could vote with your feet, like what products would you migrate towards. And so we took that information from how Zoom works and Doxy.me works and all these other products. And we worked with our vendor over the last two years to make our uh, enterprise platform better and better and better in terms of its integration. Um, doing things like text-based invites and WebRTC. And I don't think that we would have developed that anywhere near as quickly if we hadn't had experience with competing pro products and organization and providers saying, no, I prefer this product for the following reasons. Uh, but it did create a lot of chaos that we needed to get our, our, our arms around. And so we spent the last two years really trying to corral all that multi-platform use and bring everything into a single uh, platform. And you know, we need to do that for various reasons. One is we can't, from an IT perspective, we can't support five different platforms. Two, as an organization, we can't educate patients about how to use a platform if we don't know which one they're going to be using to see a doctor. Um, and three, uh, we thought it was really important for, to have a very tight integration into the electronic medical record, which for uh, our healthcare system is epic. Um, and we recognize that providers, providers don't always like living in the electronic medical record, but that's reality. We spend a lot of time working in the EMR and the EMR is a, a major source of information for patients. Um, and so we knew that we needed to put something uh, as deeply embedded into the EMR as we could from the provider perspective. Um, we had very poor adoption of my chart, which is the patient portal um, at the beginning of the pandemic as an organization, but that was a big priority for us. And so we wanted to build a system that patients could interface through my chart as a one, as a, as a tool for um, getting more people to adopt the patient portal. Um, and two is just uh, ease, of, uh, ease of use uh, for patients and allowing features like self-scheduling, et cetera. And so we spent the last two years making this, working with the vendor, making the product better and better and better and integrating it more deeply into the electronic medical record. Um, and so this is what the adoption curve looks like since the pandemic started. The blue line is our, is what we call virtual home visit telehealth. That is the Epic integrated version of extended care or enterprise platform. So you see the rising adoption over time as we made the product better. Uh, peaks here reflect um, the pandemic, right? So you see these peaks occurring during various waves. And then you see the green is the visit type telehealth, which is quote unquote off-brand platforms like Zoom, WebEx, et cetera. And so you see high utilization early on and then that's falling. And then you see telephone audio only visits gradually falling over time as well. Uh, there is variability still within the organization uh, among various clinics. So Queens Counseling is a psychiatry clinic. They still use a lot of Zoom and WebEx. And the reason for that is they do groups and classes, which is hard to replicate. Um, our primary care, this is Queen Emma Clinic, which is a primary care clinic that does a lot of indigent care. You can see they're still doing a lot of telephone visits here in blue. Queen's Neuroscience, which is my home based clinic, I'm a neurologist, is re pretty representative in the organization. The majority of visits are occurring on our enterprise platform. However, as a fail safe, there's still some pockets of Zoom and Doxy and other uh, kind of backup programs that still uh, live on. And then I think the superstar here is our comprehensive weight management program, which is doing multidisciplinary uh, telehealth visits. And, and they're doing almost 100% of their visits on our enterprise platform. So why did it take the pandemic for us to get here? Um, and I think it's important to kind of go back pre-pandemic and recognize that there were a lot of barriers that existed. Um, you know, and there's still some barriers to be sure, but there are a lot of barriers that existed that limited ad adoption of telehealth. One is uncertainty about, well, not just uncertainty. One was Medicare did not pay for direct patient services in the home. Two is we talked a lot about consumer demand, but it, it didn't really materialize in a very real way, at least in Hawaii. Um, providers were slow to adopt. Um, and we really had to leverage uh, pilots based on early adopters. Um, there were still some technology barriers. The technology was not ready for prime time. I can attest to that when we launched and 
March of 2020, um, and it's it's made uh, great leaps since then. And then the last is clinical workflows and how do you integrate telehealth into your in-person practice in a way that's fairly seamless. Those were all barriers to adoption. And so COVID was really the perfect storm in that one, uh, Medicare wa waivers were put in place that allowed reimbursement. Two, patients were afraid to go to the doctor's office. And so that provider or that patient demand that we've been talking about finally materialized. And then finally, providers were really forced to adopt this. Um, and even the ones who were laggards and really didn't want to do telehealth were, were basically blowing up my phone and, and asking how they could get on telehealth as quickly as possible. And so the question, you know, the big kind of question for this talk that, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about as I put this talk together is, you know, how would an organization behave based on its, its thoughts about the permanence of telehealth? Is this something that we're doing on a temporary basis just to get through the pandemic? Or is this an opportunity to invest in building a robust telehealth program that adds value to patients' healthcare, right? So it's not just a, um, let's get through the pandemic using audio only telephone or FaceTime, um, but let's take the opportunity to heavily invest in a telehealth program that's going to live on and hopefully continue to grow after the pandemic ends. And I think those organizational strategic choices will really um, color patients' experience of telehealth, whether they want to do it after the pandemic or not. Payers' perception of telehealth, you know, whether it's adding value to care or it's just a watered down version of in-person care without any physical exam, right? And so in a lot of ways, the choices that healthcare organizations made during the pandemic and how they responded to it, um, I think will heavily influence whether telehealth um, continues to grow for that organization after the pandemic ends, whether you know, Congress passes legislation to, to allow continued reimbursement for direct patient services, and the patient experience and whether patients will continue to ask for telehealth uh, when they have more options for in-person care. So a couple of words about reimbursement. You guys know this stuff, so I, I'll just skip through it, but you know, really the, the main issue is um, Medicare Part B, right? And whether they will continue to pay for telehealth services in the home. Um, I'm fortunate to live in Hawaii uh, where you know, a group of stakeholders um, and Christina was a big part of convening this, these stakeholders as we worked on, um, you know, the, the telehealth resource center was really a, a, a great place to convene all of the stakeholders to work on our, our, our very progressive uh, telehealth reimbursement bill. And so fortunately in 2017, um, Hawaii passed a, a omnibus bill that required reimbursement for telehealth services to patients in their homes and had no geographic restrictions. And so, for the Medicaid program in the state and the private payers, we have not been living on waivers. Like these changes were made permanent five years ago. And so the main issue and source of uncertainty, of course, is Medicare Part B and what will happen there. Um, we are currently under waivers during the PHE and really who knows when the PHE is gonna end. You know, that's really unclear at this point. Uh, there's a lot of um, legislative effort in the U.S. Congress. There's about 35 bills um, that have been introduced over the last two years, uh, looking to make some aspects of, of the telehealth waivers permanent. And again, lucky we live, hashtag lucky we live Hawaii, right? So we have uh, Senator Brian Schatz, who is, who chairs, who co-chairs the um, Senate um, Telehealth Caucus and has been working very diligently on this issue. Um, and so I, I think it's, there's a lot of kind of attitude that like the genie is out of the bottle and magically these telehealth services are going to persist beyond the pandemic, but we can't assume that, right? And, you know, I think there's a, there's a real, very real possibility that um, absent any uh, additional legislation within the U.S. Congress, which is not exactly functioning very well at the moment, uh, the genie really could get stuffed back into the bottle and we really could run off a cliff. The other risk is that there could be a backlash against telehealth. You know, yes, people did a lot of telehealth. I, I showed you a huge increase in volume, but what was their experience of telehealth? You know, did that telehealth add value to their care? Did those patients perceive that they received good healthcare services with that telehealth? Was it safe? Uh, what was the impact on cost of care for those patients? 
that's really unknown. There's really very little literature published in the last two years on those important topics. And so there's a very real possibility that if patients had bad experiences uh, with telehealth during the pandemic, that they may not want to do it. There may be a backlash against it. Um, this is data that came out last year in JAMA uh, asking patients uh, what would their preferences would be for where they, how they would receive their services after the pandemic. And the vast majority prefer in-person services over telehealth, 53% versus 20%. There are some demographic differences related to um, you know, education level, et cetera, as you might expect. But you know, really for every demographic group, patients preferred in-person visits over telehealth. So I don't think that we can make the assumption that these services will persist at the same robust level that they have during the pandemic, unless we really heavily invest in the patient experience and in making that care safe and in doing the research that we need to do to convince legislators and payers that these services add value to healthcare and they're not just a watered down version of in-person care. So see, these are some of the lessons that we learned during the pandemic. You know, one is patient selection, making sure that patients are ready, patients want to do telehealth services, that they're ready to do that. Uh, doing some pre-visit preparation to make sure patients have access to devices and broadband coverage. Um, focusing on the patient and provider experience of telehealth and making it feel professional, meeting the patient's needs. There are important rituals that go on in healthcare that um, you know, patients need to feel like I can trust this physician or I can trust this provider. And do we, do we provide that patient experience um, in a way that's meaningful to patients? And they walk away from that healthcare feeling like I have seen the doctor and I don't need to go and seek in-person care after this, right? Um, ease of use of the platform, major, major lessons learned there about, um, yes, we do wanna uh, integrate telehealth into the electronic medical record. There's a lot of merits to doing that but there needs to be like trap doors and tricks and tips of uh, saving those telehealth visits that you know, when patients can't use the patient portal or there are technology issues that are you know, very easy for patients to connect through text links, et cetera. And then finally, in a, how do you integrate into a clinic workflow so you can smoothly move between in-person care and virtual care in the setting of a clinic? Uh, prior to the pandemic, we had a lot of perceptions about what the benefits of telehealth would be. And these are things that all of us talked about, like it's convenient for the patient. It reduces travel time and cost. It's very helpful for patients who have mobility challenges and can't get out of the house. It's effective for timeliness of care, like especially telestroke um, or tele-ICU services. We spent a lot of time talking about rural communities. And you know, yes, that's an important part of the mission of PERSA is rural communities. Um, and we had the kind of questions that we asked in studies and the medical literature were about um, what would be the impact of telehealth on total cost of care? And would it just further fragment care or be duplicative with in-person care? Or would it be good enough to replace the in-person visit? And there was a lot of literature and discussion about whether we could make telehealth equivalent to the in-person visit. Those were the kind of the attitudes that I had and we, we had, I think, collectively. Um, and what I would argue as a lesson learned is that um, the focus really should not be on replacing the in-person visit. The in-person visit is sort of sacrosanct in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that we would be foolish to try and just use telehealth as a way of replacing in-person care. Um, the better question is how do we integrate telehealth into in-person care um, in a way that actually adds value to healthcare. It, that's not just about convenience, right? That's about at bringing something to the, to the table that in-person care does not, you know, not replacing in-person care or being as good as in-person care, but complementing in-person care in a way that actually adds value to healthcare. That's where I think the focus needs to be. And, you know, it's not really about all about convenience. And, you know, every sector of the economy that has virtualized over time um, I think the glib response to that is saying, oh, it's more convenient to have an app on my phone where I can do these things for myself. But, you know, these, I, I think there's overly, we overly emphasize convenience and, and there's more to it than convenience. And so we used to pay people to do banking and investment for us. We used to pay people to book our travel for us. We used to pay people to, uh, you know, order food off the menu for us and bring us food. 
And gradually those things have virtualized and become app-based. Um, and I would argue that we, what we've actually done is rather than having something be more convenient is we, we've shifted the burden of that work onto the consumer in a way that's actually acceptable to the consumer. And so rather than paying a travel agent, I'm gonna be my own travel agent, right? I would argue that that's not actually convenient, um, but it gives patients more control and ownership over uh, their travel arrangements, for example. Um, and I think we're doing the same thing in healthcare as we shift to not just telehealth, but digital health and um, you know, insert whatever word you want. Um, but in getting patients to adopt patient portals and using that for video telehealth and connecting with their doctors, what we're actually doing is shifting the burden of healthcare from going to the doctor every six months and quote unquote purchasing healthcare from them to being an activity that patients do for themselves, you know, using digital tools. And that's incredibly important of having patients take responsibility for their own healthcare um, in a way that you know, they're assigned a number to meet, which is blood pressure or glucose or weight. Uh, and they can work within a digital healthcare application to kind of take ownership of their healthcare. And I really think that that's what we're doing uh, with telehealth. It's not just about replacing the video visit, but actually shifting the burden of healthcare onto the patient in a way that's actually positive. And so, you know, I think we got it right in terms of convenience and travel, and those are positive attributes to telehealth, um, but there's a lot more to it than what we thought, right? And, and definitely it's not just about rural communities. The vast majority of telehealth that we're doing as an organization is where patients live, which are in urban communities. Um, there's great uh, value there as well. Um, but we're actually you know, doing things that add additional value to healthcare that you can't get through the in-person visit, right? Uh, and in Hawaii, we have a lot of people who have their family on the mainland who really can't uh, join in an in-person healthcare visit. You can put them on speakerphone, but the reality is that, is that that's often not done. So the multi-party aspects of video telehealth and allowing virtual family presence, that's been a huge boon for us here in Hawaii. Um, language interpretation services of bringing in a video interpreter into the visit uh, and building that into the program has added great value. Uh, device integration using Bluetooth enabled devices to bring vital signs um, and some elements of the physical examination into the video visit uh, has, been, has been very important. And then, uh, you know, increasing the portal adoption and EMR integration. So as I mentioned, we use MyChart, um, Epic MyChart as our patient portal. And in a lot of ways, I've seen, you know, when we try to uh, encourage patients to use MyChart or adopt MyChart as a means of using video to see their doctor, then we can um, help patients gain proficiency with that portal. And once they do that, there's a lot of other things they can do other than just using video to see their doctor, reading their notes, uh, looking at their lab work. Um, and that really um, helps encourage some of the things that I talked about, about shifting the responsibility of healthcare onto the patient. Um, and so we've uh, created tools uh, and educational materials to help patients join video visits through MyChart. Uh, this is kind of the sequence of events. I'm sure many of you have used MyChart, but the patient logs on, finds their visit, does a hardware check to make sure the video is gonna succeed, and then joins the video visit, uh, and then it launches them into our third-party application, which is extended care. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of uh, benefits to both, both the patient and provider for using this Epic integrated uh, platform. Um, one is that it's a consistent platform that patients, doesn't matter if you're gonna see a pulmonologist or a rheumatologist or your primary care doctor within our organization, um, you're going to use the same tool and gain some proficiency with that tool. And uh, two are the features and functionalities that we spent the last two years building into the platform, like multi-party calls and translation. Uh, and then three is that we have a consistent IT uh, response um, if there are issues that we, we can support a single platform. And so this is kind of how it works for the provider. There is a visit type in Epic called, that we call virtual home visit telehealth that we have built into the electronic medical record. And so when the patient is scheduled using that video type or that visit type, uh, what it means is that the patient materials that go out, like their after visit summary or their reminder for their, their visit, 
is correct, right? It, it tells, it doesn't tell them come to the clinic, right? It tells them, here's how to log on your video visit. Um, and then the billing codes and like, cause every insurance company has different codes and different um, modifiers that you need to use. All that logic is kind of built into this visit type. So the provider doesn't have to think about that. As long as this visit type is used in Epic, then all that information is correct and all that down, downstream workflow um, has been designed. This is how um, it looks on the provider side. The, when the patient checks in through my chart, they arrive themselves. So the clinic staff does not have to arrive the patient manually. The camera turns green, the provider double clicks the camera, it launches extended care, and then drops the patient and provider into the video visit. Um, and then within the video visit, we have a lot of features and functionalities that we've developed. I'll show you a few of them pretty quickly. Um, that uh, these are kind of bells and whistles that I think uh, have really added value to the, the telehealth services. Um, one of them is multi-party, as I've made an allusion to, and this allows, uh, you know, in a patient to provider visit, a family member or even another provider could be invited through a text invite and an SMS message goes out to the patient, to, to the guest. And then they just click the link. They don't have to download an app and they're dropped into the web RTC visit. Uh, and so that's added great value in terms of virtual family presence and inviting guests. The other that we integrated is we use a company called Marty for our video language translation services. Uh, we helped our vendor, uh, we helped the two vendors basically in the organization uh, design an interface so we can invite a Marty translator uh, as a third party into the video visit. Uh, and and the, uh, the interpreter can be audio only or, or video. And we actually um, uh, designed a link into Epic. So in Epic demographics, it knows what language the patient speaks. So Epic passes that information into the extended care application. So you can see in this case, uh, the patient needs a Portuguese interpreter. And then you can bypass the operator and go directly to a Portuguese interpreter and then bring that interpreter into the video visit. Uh, screen capture, um, this allows, you know, either the patient can send a picture off their device that they've already taken, or the provider can do a screen capture and place that picture into the patient's electronic medical record um, out of extended care. And then this has been great for our COVID hotline um, that we just stood up on virtual urgent care about two months ago. Um, and we just created a test to treat paradigm. So patients do home testing uh, for COVID. They actually hold the um, home test up to the screen. We do a screen capture of the image showing a positive test, drop that into the electronic medical record. And then we can schedule those patients for uh, infusion therapies um, for high risk COVID. Uh, you know, other examples like rash, uh, et cetera, are, are, are fairly obvious. Um, Providers who use Haiku and Canto, which are uh, mobile applications of Epic, can, can do their video visits within that. Um, as I mentioned, we created a uh, unique visit type for this. This allows us to track the data of how many uh, video telehealth services are occurring across the organization and also kind of standardize those downstream workflows that I mentioned. Uh, patient selection is important. So um, we've been working with our clinics to uh, make sure patients are screened to make sure they're appropriate for telehealth. One of the mantras we've used in the organization is at, uh, telling patients, ask your doctor if telehealth is right for you. And that, you know, one, it prompts the patient to know that telehealth is an option, but it leaves it to the doctor to determine if it's clinically appropriate for that patient. And so we've been working as an organization within our ambulatory leadership to create guidelines uh, for determining when uh, telehealth visits, especially for new patient evaluations, when those are clinically appropriate. And also, you know, screening tools for the staff to determine if patients have appropriate broadband coverage and devices to have successful visits. Uh, this is our uh, brochure for patients. Um, again, using that phrase, ask your doctor if a video visit is right for you, and then giving patients the uh, tools that they need to uh, get started on my chart and learn how to use vi video visits in the organization. Um, Preparing for the telehealth visit, um, you know, one of the deficiencies I think that we experienced with direct to patient telehealth is, is the limitations of the physical examination during that visit. 
right? There's a lot of things that you can't do in terms of physical examination, using, especially using a smartphone in, in the patient's home. Um, and, uh, you know, in particular, if you're a primary care physician, you're seeing a patient for hypertension, you really need vital signs, right? You need blood pressure and you need access to some vital signs during the ex examination. In the early days of the pandemic, we handled that by giving uh, patients a box that had a, tel uh, had a blood pressure cuff and other devices, glucometer, et cetera. Um, and more recently, we've been working on device integration through Bluetooth enabled devices in Epic. So patients are able to upload their uh, weight, um, blood pressure, and other vital signs prior to the visit. And so I think this will be a really important part of some of the investment that we're doing to make telehealth more safe and more robust in, in caring for patients. On the negative side, Christina mentioned that I'm a neurointensivist. So I take care of patients who are critically ill from huge strokes and intracerebral hemorrhages. And you know, I have to say, I've seen you know, young patients in their 40s or 50s presenting in the last year uh, with intracerebral hemorrhage related to untreated hypertension. And when I look back to the electronic medical record, they've had multiple visits with their doctor during the pandemic that were telephone visits with no vital signs or video visits with, with no blood pressure measurement. And so I think, you know, we have to ask ourselves how to make those visits safer, um, especially for something like hypertension, where you really need vital signs um, and you really need to be able to document um, that blood pressure medications are effective or we will increase the cost of care. We, we will uh, erode the quality of care uh, inadvertently. So this is, I think, a really important part of how we are gonna be investing in, in making these services more robust and meaningful. Um, telehealth is not for everybody. You know, obviously patients who really need a hands-on physical examination, um, we need to screen them for in-person services. This is also where the clinic to clinic model, that brick and mortar clinic on the neighbor islands in particular, where patients can come into a clinic, you know, especially patients who don't have good access to broadband in the home or need some vital signs, physical examination components, x-rays, EKG, lab work, et cetera. Um, they can get those kind of services in a brick and mortar clinic, even if the physician is remote. So um, screening out a patient for video, a direct to patient telehealth does not necessarily mean they can't do telehealth, but it should be done in more of a clinic setting. Um, as I mentioned, we, you know, we created the visit types for, for telehealth uh, within Epic, and we've been building out uh, event notifications that you know, one, alert patients to how to join their video visit and do a tech check prior to the visit, but also that we can the office staff can communicate with the patient if the provider is running late or, tele or prompting them when it's time to uh, join the video visit. And so that's something that we've built out recently uh, called event notifications. For patients who are not joining through my chart, um, who are instead joining through a direct join link, uh, we created an event notification that would allow the patient to do a technology check prior to the visit. So the clinic staff, like 15 minutes before the visit, can send out this tech check link. And then the patient clicks the link and that allows them to, to test their hardware and make sure they're going to have a successful video visit. So just a few kind of best practices within our organization. One is setting expectations. Uh, for the patient, so the patient, one, that they know they're doing a video visit, make sure that they want to do that uh, and are ready to do that. Two, you know, doing the best that we can to get all of, of the patients active and proficient with my chart prior to the visit. Um, and that's going to be the best tool for them to succeed um, and have a successful visit. Uh, you know, but we recognize that there are some patients who cannot use a patient portal or will not use a patient portal. And so one of the important uh, lessons, as I mentioned, with using some of those other consumer devices or consumer uh, applications like Doxy is the ease of use factor of getting a web link or getting a URL texted to you and clicking that link and not going through a patient portal and not downloading the application and still having face-to-face -face video. And so that's one of the things that we developed over the last two years is using Epic direct join links uh, to send out a text message or email invite to patients. So if they're not using the patient portal uh, or they're you know, having trouble using the patient portal one day of visit, that there's a way of getting around that and still having a successful visit. 
So this is Epic Direct Join Links. Um, basically click the box. Um, Epic knows the patient's phone number and email address. Hopefully that's accurate. And then the patient gets a, a URL and they click the link, just like that guest invite I showed you. They can um, uh, click the URL, use the WebRTC functionality, not download an application and go right into the video visit. So it, it is still integrated into Epic in a way that the patient is arrived. Uh, when they do that through a direct join link, the camera turns green, et cetera. Um, and then the last uh, best practice is making sure that patients have the opportunity to test their hardware prior to the visit. Um, we're working on an integration right now. Um, we actually launched it and then we found some glitches with it. We pulled it back and we're about to relaunch it where when you send the uh, tech check to the patient and they complete that check, um, it'll be like green, yellow, red within the um, multi-provider schedule on Epic. So you can see, the clinic staff can see, oh, this patient had a failed hardware check before the visit. And I will reach out to that patient and either reschedule them um, or work with them to, um, to make sure the visit is, is successful. So this is the hardware check, um, basically allows camera and microphone and connectivity speed to be checked before the visit. We do have a, we still have a app as a backup option. We actually, two years ago um, when we went live, it was all app-based. So in addition to the MyChart app, the patients would have to download the extended care app in order to do the visit. Now we're doing about 97% of our visits on WebRTC without an application. But we thought it was important to still have an app available as a backup option because there have been issues that occur with any WebRTC based platform where uh, when, for example, Google changes to a new version or what have you, that it breaks it temporarily. And so we do have an app that patients can download as, as a, a backup option. Um, other ways to, to deal with uh, failed visits or, or visits that with um, kind of glitchy video or audio, uh, we just put in place a remote rejoin option. So the provider can actually force the patient to rejoin the video visit. That's really helpful when the patient has, for some reason, not enabled their camera or microphone, right? So the patient doesn't enable their microphone and then you can see the patient, but there's no audio. We've all dealt with that frustration, right? That's one of the major reasons video visits fail. This will allow the provider to force a remote rejoin onto the patient. And then they'll have the opportunity again to say, yes, enable my camera, yes, enable my microphone and be able to salvage that visit. The other, um, kind of safety valve that we just introduced is PSTN dialing. This is standard telephone dialing through the extended care application. So we work with a vendor and Twilio uh, on putting this in place. And this would be familiar to any of you using WebEx or Zoom where you use the call my phone option because we all recognize that audio is better on the phone. It just is, you know, PSTN audio is just better than video audio. Um, and so this would allow you to replace the audio that is inherent to the video platform with a PSTN call or place an audio only call out of the video platform or invite, not just invite a guest, um, but actually phone call a guest. So you can actually place a PSTN telephone call out of the video application and bring a family member in by audio only. So this is a new tool that we just introduced that I think is going to uh, add a lot of value uh, to the system. Um, this is kind of how it works. You basically invite or call, and it can either send a text link as an invite, or it can um, directly dial the patient. A few words about telephone audio only. Um, and, you know, Christine and I have a lot of discussion about the value of audio only telephone calls. And I see both sides of it, right? And I, you know, there are patients who just can't do video or won't do video and they need healthcare. And um, there are visits that fail on day of visit and have to convert to audio, right? And I understand that. Um, but by the same token, how much, how much do you really want to water down your healthcare, right? <laughs> we're, we're making compromises with video telehealth and we have to be honest with ourselves about that. The physical examination is very limited, right? And even if the patient has a blood pressure cuff, you're dependent on them accurately measuring their own blood pressure to record that. 
So we are making some compromises when we do face-to-face -face video telehealth. Um, that I spent the last 30, 50 slides showing you how we've tried to mitigate. I just don't see that with telephone audio only. And I have grave concerns that rather than you know, addressing the digital divide with audio only, that we may be providing services that are not safe or valuable to patients who don't have access to care through either video or in-person care. And you guys can throw tomatoes at me, that's fine. I know there's a lot of controversy. I mean, I, I hear it from primary care providers practicing in rural communities that they need this. Um, but I just think, you know, if, if telephone was a great way to provide healthcare, if this was a technological advance that was great for patients, we would have done it 80 years ago, right? And I just don't see non-integrated audio only quote unquote telehealth services is adding great value to patients' care. So I'm happy to debate that with you, but that's my, I was given a soapbox and so I'm gonna express my, my opinion here. Um, and so I think this is a better solution to patients who can't do video telehealth in the home is having kiosks and satellite clinics so they can come into a brick and mortar clinic and get telehealth services and some aspect of in-person care like vitals taken by professional, right? Um, as a better, um, as a better kind of safety valve for patients who can't do telehealth in their home. And I'll, I guess I'll just say that I'll exclude behavioral health from a lot of the comments that I just made, because I do think that there's a role for behavioral health and, and some counseling services uh, in audio only. Um, this is our clinic to clinic program. I'll just kind of breeze through this in the interest of time, except to mention that um, one of the other kind of pillars of the telehealth that we developed is that from the provider perspective and the clinic perspective, I wanted single platform, like that was my goal. I wanted to get one platform that could do all of telemedicine, telehealth, telemedicine um, on the same platform and have the same feature set, have the same workflow, look exactly the same, feel the same for the providers. And so from the provider perspective, it doesn't matter if the patient is home, if the patient is in a brick and mortar satellite clinic or the patient's in an emergency room or even an ICU within our health, healthcare system, the way to join that video visit is through Epic, through that camera, through extended care, through the virtual care room. And it has all the same feature sets like video translation, share screen, invite guest, et cetera. And that's what we have done over the last year is build out clinic to clinic telehealth within Epic. So it connects through extended care and you can connect to devices in these, um, in these clinics. Um, and so this is how it works. You know, it goes through our um, extended care virtual care room. You look for a device uh, and then dial that device directly out of extended care and connects to the device. The device has far end camera control. So there are remote pan tilt zoom cameras that you can use to uh, get a better examination of the patient. There are also peripheral devices that are connected like electronic stethoscope, et cetera. Um, and and yet from the provider perspective, all of this looks exactly the same as you would for a virtual home visit. A couple of words about hospital-based telehealth, uh, similar to my comments about clinic to clinic telehealth. We also integrated Epic and extended care into our telestroke program. And so even for our stroke providers um, who are doing hospital-based or ER-based uh, emergency services, we are now using extended care. Um, as I mentioned, I'm on call for Telestroke right now, so I'm covering these 11 hospitals, um, and we're doing about 500 uh, Telestroke visits per year as an organization, now completely converted over to using our uh, Epic integrated um, instance of extended care. Um, and so I'll kind of wrap this up. Um, again, I was given a soapbox, so I'm going to express my opinions here, but I'll wrap this up by coming back to that original question of like, how would a healthcare organization behave and what investment choices would we make if we were basically holding our breath for the pandemic to end and a return to normal in-person care and just kind of biding our time using telephone and consumer grade applications versus how would a healthcare organization behave if we were fully invested in taking this great opportunity that we have to build out telehealth in a robust manner that actually adds value to in-person care uh, rather than just trying to 
replace that with some kind of watered down version of in-person care. Um, and, and, you know, so these are some of the things that I think are really important considerations moving forward as we transition eventually, hopefully as the pandemic winds down and we transition to the quote unquote new normal. Um, there's, you know, big questions about reimbursement and we cannot sit on our laurels, right? You guys as TRCs, you can't lobby, but I can lobby and I'm lobbying like hell, right? And every healthcare organization needs to be lobbying like hell. We need to be top of mind in Congress. And trust me, we are not anymore um, to get these services permanently reimbursed in Medicare. We cannot make the assumption that these will continue, right? It's gonna take a lot of work on our part. And some of that work is not just convincing a Senator, right? Some of it is like put up or shut up. Like, where's the data? Where is the data showing that this is safe? Where is the data showing this is effective? Where is the patient experience data? Where is the cost of care data? Like we need to be providing that data in a way that con convinces the Congressional Budget Office that this is gonna be budget neutral, right? So that's important work that we have to do. We can't make the assumption that the genie's out of the bottle. Two is that consumer preferences are gonna be incredibly important and they're gonna be colored by the experience of telehealth during the pandemic. If patients had crappy experiences with telehealth, they're not gonna to wanna to do it and we're gonna see a backlash. Uh, and providers also, providers aren't gonna to wanna to continue doing it if they spent 15 out of 30 minutes doing you know, technology troubleshooting with patients during the visit. We have to transition from this mindset of this being a temporary solution to being something that's baked in and adds value to care. Um, and so I mentioned consumer preferences and we've got to provide, we've got to use telehealth as a tool that provides uh, additional services for patients and value for patients beyond just um, considerations of convenience. Um, patients have to walk away from the telehealth experience feeling they, that they've seen the doctor that their medical needs were met, that it felt like seeing the doctor, right? That we met the sort of rituals and expectations that patients have of seeing the doctors that help us build trust in that video visit. And so the physical examination is part of that. It. It's not just a dog and pony show. Like the patient has to walk away feeling like they've been examined by the doctor. That's really, really important. I've heard that from patients who would say, yes, telehealth is convenient. I like being able to see my doctor, but my doctor never examined me. They didn't even attempt to do any physical examination during, during the visit. We've got to be able to meet those expectations of patients or they're going to seek in-person care elsewhere and it will drive up the cost of care and be, uh, you know, lead to fragmentation of care and duplicative care. We have got to really invest in clinic workflows and making this seamless. So a provider can see a patient in person in a clinic room, walk out of that room into an office, see another patient virtually in exactly the same fashion. Uh, while the, the doctor is doing that virtual visit in the office, the clinic staff is bringing in the next in-person patient. And then the doctor goes into that, back into that clinic room and sees the next patient. And all the intake and communication that occurs in person in the clinic, we need to figure out a way of replicating that, right? So, so the medical assistants have a role in checking in the patient and talking to them and getting a medication list and getting that information that the doctor needs before the visit occurs. Um, and you know, uh, really even investing in the architecture of the clinic or the clinic design um, in a way that, that recognizes both in-person care and virtual care uh, during those visits. And this is a mock-up that we did um, during the pandemic of a standard uh, we're basically trying to standardize what does the Queens Clinic look like. And we didn't want to have doctors doing telehealth visits in clinic rooms, right? Because that's a waste of a clinic room. And so this is our mock-up of the telehealth room. It's better than a phone booth. Like you don't want to go in a little booth and be uncomfortable and hate it, right? So it's got to be like ergonomic for the doctor and comfortable, but not a full-size clinic room with a you know, table and devices and, and things that we don't need for telehealth visits. So an example of how to use architecture to truly integrate telehealth into a, an office um, here. And so I'm gonna leave you with these points and wrap up here. Um, you know, the questions really are how, how invested are we in maintaining telehealth as the pandemic winds down? What do we need to do on a regulatory basis? And, and how do we build that case in, in a way 
uh, that's meaningful, not just to make an emotional appeal to a legislator, but to convince CMS and the Congressional Budget Office that these services add value and don't increase cost of care. Um, how do we not leave vulnerable populations behind who are not proficient with patient portals and don't have good broadband coverage and don't have access to devices? And then finally, um, you know, doing more robust data and analytics to, to make sure video visits are gonna succeed, to kind of get out in front of that um, and you know, look at the uh, effect on value and safety of patient care. Um, and so I showed you a lot about volume and it's pretty easy for me to show you data about volume, but what I didn't show you in this talk is very much about patient experience or safety or cost. And I think it's on us to really grow our analytics to do that. This is um, our success rate, at least as we measure it. And good news is from a technology standpoint, our success rate of video visits is going up. It's about 85% now as an organization. Um, but you know, just because it was technically successful doesn't mean that it met the patient's needs and the patient experience was good and that it, it provided valuable healthcare. Uh, we also have a lot of data about why visits succeed or fail based on, uh, it's kind of amazing actually how much data you can pull from the patient side, like what device they're on, where that device is, what their network strength is, what version of software they're on, what browser they're using. And so that is valuable information to integrate back into the video visit to figure out, okay, let's create an algorithm that determines upfront based on what the patient has, whether that visit is gonna succeed or fail and then reschedule it you know, as an in-person visit or clinic to clinic if they're high risk to fail, or at least call them and get them to update from their iOS 6 to you know, iOS 12 or higher, right? Um, this is data from you know, just dipping our toes into uh, value of care and patient satisfaction. This is data from our virtual urgent care program that we just stood up two months ago and looking at patient satisfaction. And the good news is that about 85% of patients said that they, 87%, um, uh, I guess 88%, doing the math here on the fly, a patient said that they were likely or very, very likely to use telehealth services in the future after their video visit. And then when we ask patients, again, this is urgent care here. So this is low acuity patient initiated video visits. And when we asked them if they hadn't gotten their care through our platform where they would have gone, 30% of them said they would have done nothing. They would have just waited for their condition to worsen. Um, and then we, we uh, averted a lot of unnecessary ER visits and urgent care and in-person urgent care visits with these patients. So just beginning to dip our toes into that kind of analytics and data. And so this is my last slide. I'm going to end here. Um, you know, the folk, you know, just to reiterate, the focus really has to be on patient experience and satisfaction for this to continue. We need better analytics um, for a variety of reasons. And we need to work together to, to really study the impact of what happened during this experiment, right? This experiment in this controlled laboratory of the last two years of what, what did, you know, yes, we dramatically increased utilization of telehealth. And that's, maybe that's great, right? Maybe it's not. We, I think we need to prove that. Right? What was the impact of doing that on the cost of care? What was the impact on patient safety and hospitalizations and ER visits? And that's something that we need to work together as a state here in Hawaii to take the opportunity and take the data that we have and try to answer some of those questions. So I'm sorry I got right up until the end of the webinar here, um, but I want to thank you. And I definitely can stay on a little bit longer if there are questions and, and you guys have more time. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cohen. That was a very comprehensive presentation. Loved hearing how we went from this gigantic opportunity of forcing you to use telehealth and the experiment, as you mentioned, to how you've now refined, you know, the telehealth protocols and systems and to add value and to empower the patients, but make it safe with safeguards and easy <laughs> to use. Um, Aria, I just wanted to check with you. Could we do one or two, just maybe one or two questions? Well, yeah, of course. Okay. 
Dr. Koenig, there's been, there were a lot of um, chat and discussions. A lot of the questions you answered during the course of your presentation, so I'll just pick two. Um, one is how do you, in, in terms of safeguards, how do you ensure in the moment of safety for establishing safety protocols for the patient? For example, during a telehealth visit, 911 services need to be called. Yeah, I think we, we have not offered enough. Um, I think we have left that up to clinics and providers, probably more than we should have as an organization out of necessity. Um, but in the last few months, what we've done is convened the medical directors of our various specialty ambulatory clinics, and we've come up with a series of guidelines. And these are not fixed rules, but they're guidelines for the clinics that state um, basically when is telehealth appropriate and not appropriate. Um, and it does you know, provide uh, guidance about uh, emergency care and converting to in-person visits or referring patients to one of our urgent care clinics in the ER. So that's something that we've done. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I'll just say structurally, I am a provider, but most of our telehealth department are um, analysts and managers, directors, et cetera. And so we I would say that we support telehealth in clinics, but we don't really control directly how those services are provided um, on an operational, clinical operational basis. And so we really have recognized that we hadn't done a good enough job of partnering with clinical operations, um, mostly bandwidth, right? And we've tried to backtrack and really say, you know, how do we partner with our ambulatory leadership to create guidelines to tell clinics like, when is it appropriate? How is it appropriate? Where should the provider be? That kind of stuff. So I think we're, we're doing that more now, but we certainly could have done more of that um, in the last two years. Oh, thank you. Um, and the final question is regarding your telehealth team, as you just mentioned. Could you talk a little bit about what your team makeup was, you know, like before the pandemic and this is so comprehensive. What does, what does this telehealth team look like today to make all of this happen? Yeah, so we started, um, it was like me and Burke. <laughs> Burke Holbrook. First of all, thank you to my, thank you to the telehealth team. Um, you know, I, nothing is done in the vacuum. So everything that I presented to you really is the work, not of me, but of uh, a team of, of uh, really great coworkers. So Burke Holbrook is our clinical operations manager. We, during the pandemic, we hired a telehealth trainer, Brendan Fitzgibbons, who's wearing like 10 different hats. So he's not just training. Uh, and we have a few analysts. We have um, two technical analysts, uh, Sean Kearney and Scott Jun. And then we have a Epic Boost resource who's been like incredibly valuable named Dylan Dulick, who everything that I just showed you in terms of uh, building out all that epic integration Dylan has done on our behalf and we want to just keep him forever. Um, so that's the team. Um, in about six months ago, we actually hired Ernst and Young to do a, um, to do a audit, like a, you know, a self, self initiated audit of our telehealth program and give us some guidance about how do we right size the program and what are productivity metrics that, uh, um, you know, based on the volume of telehealth services that we're doing, like how many FTE should we have supporting the program and what should our growth curve look like over the next five years in terms of where the, we live in the org structure and when do we take a step up in terms of bringing on a director or VP. And so that was really uh, valuable to gain, gain some insight from them about looking at other organizations that maybe function in a more uh, robust manner and how they are, they structure their departments. And so we have an open position currently. Okay, all right, I'll put in a plug here. We have an open position for a business analyst um, in our telehealth department. So if you think that you uh, would be good for that, um, and that's the person who's gonna really help us with some of the analytics that I talked about, about pulling in technical data, um, clinical data, patient experience data, and creating dashboards and algorithms that'll help us figure out, you know, decision trees for where patients get their services, 
um, and just how we can use our analytics in a more robust manner to make sure that the visits are successful and they're adding value to care, et cetera. So we have an open position for a business analyst uh, for someone to help us kind of build out analytics and dashboards uh, to do that. So that's the next step for us. That's great, uh, Dr. Koenig, thank you for that. I just wanted to leave you with the last comment from um, the participants. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you so much, really timely information. And for myself, I just wanted to, you know, really thank you for your leadership and your vision. Um, it's amazing how you make the spaghetti mess of everything that's been done sounds so clear and organized and systematic, you know, but we know there's so much work that goes behind it for you to come out with these lessons learned that's actually represented in an integrated system. I'm just really blown away by all of that. So thank you for your time, um, Dr. Koenig, and really appreciate that. I'm gonna turn it over now to Aria to close out the sessions with some final announcements. Thank you, Christina. Uh, just a reminder that our next webinar will be held on Thursday, August 18th, and that will be hosted by the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center. Uh, registration information is available on the NCTRC events page. And lastly, we do ask that you take a few short minutes to complete the survey that will pop up at the conclusion of this webinar. Your feedback is very valuable to us. Uh, thank you again to Dr. Koenig for his presentation to the Pacific Basin Telehealth Resource Center for hosting today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone.